I want to thank all of you for making your way out on this dark and wet night and into this place of warmth to celebrate with us. This is the 50th anniversary of the Technology and Culture Forum. My name is Thea Keith-Lucas. I'm Episcopal Chaplain to MIT, and I'm privileged to coordinate this forum which is a partnership between the Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts and MIT to bring ethical inquiry and human values to the center of the life of this university. Over the years, the forum has hosted many distinguished speakers and addressed many timely and pressing topics. At the heart of all this work, has been the conviction that every human life has meaning and dignity, a unique value that must be treasured above all other ends. This ideal shows in the questions we ask here and the ways that we ask them, always inviting in as wide a diversity of voices as we can in an honest and respectful dialogue. Tonight, we are honored to have with us Kristen Renwick Monroe as director of the Interdisciplinary Center for the Scientific Study of Ethics and Morality at the University of California's Irvine campus. Professor Monroe embarks on truly collaborative research reaching across disciplines and inviting students in as full partners in the work. Professor Monroe offers a distinctive voice in the field of political psychology because she perseveres in asking hard but essential questions. What makes acts of compassion and altruism possible? when we assume a world of rational self-interest. Where do people find the courage to stand up against the forces of destruction and injustice? And in her latest book, which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, Professor Monroe addresses tonight's topic. How do we hold on to our humanity even in the extreme environment of war. Kristen, we are so glad to have you. Thank you. Let me turn this on. Um, I'm very deeply honored to be here. I noticed Charles Vest's student street. He's one of my personal heroes in the feminist movement, so I'm, it's, a, Special pleasure for me to be there, uh, be here so near that. And I'm a little daunted because I'm not a hardcore scientist. I got a request this afternoon from someone who had a very fancy title that was very off-putting. I didn't know anything about even what it is, a radiological engineer of some sort. Um, and so I, I think I should start by telling a story about um, graduate school. I was in a course with Albert Wolstetter, who was Assistant uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense under Kennedy. And we had to go and have, I was, the course was on nuclear strategy of some kind. And we had to go have our papers approved by him before we did the papers. So I wandered into his office. I'm a first year graduate student, about as green as you could get. I had no idea what it meant to be an academic. I was just kind of enjoying the courses. And he got very excited and said, oh, I think you should do something on the nuclear free zone in Nor Norway, in Nordic countries. And he kept going on. And I finally had to tell him, I'm not Scandinavian. I'm from Illinois. Um, I just you know, happen to have a name that sounds Scandinavian. I don't speak Danish. I don't speak Norwegian. I don't speak Swedish, no Finland. You know. And he was very upset. And he said, oh, 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 I know what we can do. They've just released Enrico Fermi private papers. So you can, I can get you into the rare book room and you can look at those. I didn't have the heart to tell him I didn't know anything about physics. And my Italian was non-existent. So I said, OK. So I went down every day faithfully up to the, you know, the rare book room, which is a beautiful, I think it's now the office of the president of the University of Chicago, a very beautiful room overlooking 
gorgeous midway, and uh, would be there from nine to five. And I would, it was actually pretty easy to do because if you don't speak Italian, you don't read physics, you can cruise through a lot of material really fast. <laughs> but, but what I did take away with it was this, um, Leo Szilard, a lot of the uh, atomic physicists after the war and after the bomb had come, they were concerned about it. And they kind of felt that maybe they should take their superior training and intellect and kind of clean up some of these political problems because the politicians obviously weren't capable of doing it. And so they formed the, uh, uh, later became the Union of Atomic Scientists, have the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And Leo Szilard worked with, uh, sat up with Fermi every night for a week, trying to get Fermi to join and lend the tremendous prestige of his name to this enterprise. And at the end of it, Fermi looked at him and very sadly said, I'm very sorry. There's nothing I can do for you. There are too many variables. So my <laughs> point from all of that is that when you deal with ethical issues in human beings, there often are a lot of variables. And it's, that's, so I really am not going to have very many answers for you, but maybe have some better questions. So uh, what I'd like to do tonight is talk about a project that actually grew out of a class that I had. And um, I called it a darkling plane, which comes from the Matthew Arnold poem. And it was, uh, the subtitle is Stories of Conflict in Humanity During War. It's just out by Cambridge University Press, and I did it with two student interns, uh, one of whom did the um, PowerPoint for this is much fancier than anything I could do. <laughs> so you'll see letters kind of jumping around. Um, and two students. So I had a course called, um, I wanted to teach something on war and international relations, and I wanted the students to have an idea what it's actually like to live through a war, because fortunately, most of them haven't. And, um, so I, I planned the course as a very small seminar, maybe 20, 30 people, and I ordered the books and I went off for the summer and I came back at the end of the fall ter uh, summer term and went in to get the books from the departmental secretary and she said, they're over there and do you want the books for the TA too? And I said, there's no TA in the course, it's a very small course. And she said, Christy, it's got a waiting list, it's 80 students and there's a waiting list a mile long for the course. And I thought, oh great, what am I gonna do? Big course room like this. So I thought, well, the heck with it. I'm going to go ahead and teach the course I want to teach anyway. So we, we did it um, so that they had, we did a lot of readings and biographies and, and um, we showed some films, some things about what it's like to be, be in a war, some literature. And then they had to go out and do an interview with somebody who had lived through a war. And the papers, I thought they would mostly be interviews with people from Iraq or maybe Afghanistan. No, they were amazing things. They had one girl who interviewed her great-grandmother, who had been six years old during the Armenian Genocide, was now nearly 100. I had people from World War II. I had people from Vietnam. It was amazing. And these papers were fabulous. And I said, Some, we should really publish these. They're really interesting stories. And if anybody's interested, we can work together on this, because I do like working with, with other people. It's a lot of fun. So one girl who was a visiting student from, uh, she's a Danish student from St. Mary College in London, and a student who had heard that we were presenting something on the Armenian genocide, was not enrolled in the class, but came because he was Armenian and he wanted to know about it. So he came. And so they worked with me on the paper. And then during the summer, I had two summer interns, one of whom you'll notice has the name Lampros Monroe, which is my daughter. Um, and so we actually, we put the book together. So here's why I, I, I called it a darkling plane, uh, despite the marketing board at Princeton who didn't like it. And I'm just going to read this because it's a beautiful poem. And it's going to be the best language you hear tonight. <laughs> Uh, the sea is calm tonight, the tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the straits on the French coast, the light gleams and is gone, the cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay, come to the window, sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land, listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand, begin and cease and then again begin with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea, the sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar, <clears throat> retreating to the breath of the night wind, down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another, for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light 
nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggles and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. And I like the title of it because the class reminded me of that. They were these typical Southern California students. They had backpacks, and they, most of them wear shorts all year round because it's very warm there. And they were kind of laughing and giggling. But underneath, they had really communed with someone who had really gone to hell and had lived there and had had to deal with it. And so the stories, I think, reflect some of that. So that's why I called it that. So we had a few, the few it was very simple, uh, just a pedagogical exercise, although we did put the through the IRB training. We asked them to go out and ask people to tell us, tell me about your war, because I wanted them to learn about the war. I wanted to ask them what moral choices they, uh, people had confronted, because it was a course on ethics. And then I asked them, why did you keep your, how did you keep your humanity during war? Reclaim it later. And that was really all we asked them. And they were told just to let the interviews go wherever they wanted to, to try to respect the people as human beings. If they got into areas that were difficult, to not push them. And there were a lot of interviews where that happened. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit just about some of the people. I'll just give you a few. Um, this is my daughter's bouncing, Frank Lynch. Um, Frank Lynch was a man who went to Stanford, was it, um, um, in Stanford during the war, enlisted, went into the uh, Navy, uh, Air Force, actually, which was then part of the Army, I guess. And he later uh, returned to Stanford, married a woman who was Stanford Dale Connor's roommate, uh, went on and became an engineer, worked with Hewitt and Packard, and was president of Northrop Grumman Aviation, and retired, decided he didn't want to hang around and go on cruises and go play golf. So he came back to school, and he wandered into one of my classes and, and um, hit it off, and he took all, all my courses. We became very good friends. He was a helper at the Ethics Center. He would give me advice on how to do things, since I know nothing about, about organizing financial things. And he unfortunately died about six months after we did this interview with him. So he talks about being in World War II in the South Pacific um, and being in, he was in what they called support services. So he was at a lot of bad battles, but he wasn't actually involved in them, but he was there cleaning up afterwards. Uh, the second person is one I'm very proud of. Her name is Laurel, Laura Hillman. I took my daughter and a friend of hers in high school, I think they were about 15 then, to go to hear, it was a, a play, uh, an opera, The Diary of Anne Frank, and they had a woman who was uh, singing the role, and then they had a white-haired woman sitting on the stage, and every so often she'd read something from her book, and she was Laura Hillman, and was, would have been the same age that Anne had been, had Anne lived. Uh, so she was actually 287 on Schindler's list. So that we were invited to the cast party afterwards, and I really wanted my daughter and her friend to meet Hillman because I'm very concerned about the kind of pernicious um, denial of the Holocaust, and I want young people to know if they can meet somebody. And afterwards, Chloe said, she was really interesting, Mom. Why don't you invite her down to the Ethics Center? So she came during the summer, and she, she told the story of her life. It was a very nice. And this is her book. She's written a book called uh, I Promised You a Lilac Tree. Uh, the next person is a woman named Mafalda, and that's an interesting story. Uh, I did a book called The Hand of Compassion, where I interviewed people who rescued Jews, and one of them was a man named Otto Springer, who had been an ethnic German living in Czechoslovakia during the war. And he had had a residual kind of uh, relationship with the July 20th plot. He was sent to Vienna right after the uh, plot. He was supposed to meet with a woman whose code name was Mafalda. And she had showed up once before with a lady in waiting. So he figured she was someone of royal birth because she had this lady waiting with her and um, he wasn't sure exactly what it was and he had tried to track her down after the war and he said that he thought she was Marie Adelheid de Braganza who was the, married, the sister of the Portuguese pretender to the throne after Salazar took over in Portugal. And he said, I've tried to track her down. I, my friend turned in Toxis, gave me her email. I think she's married to a Dutchman named Van Uden, but I don't know. And he didn't want me to print any of this information till her 50-year secrecy agreement was up, which I thought was very touching. He didn't want to reveal her identity until 50 years after the war. And so I have a little brief paragraph of that in the book. The book comes out, I think it's um, I don't know, 2004. And I got an email, just I was going to class one day, it's a man named Nuno von Uden, and he said, I wonder if you can tell me something about my mother. And I thought, this is a little odd. And he said, her, and he described her, and he said, my son took a course in political science in Austria, and he called me up, he read your book, and he said, Dad, I think this is Grandma. 
And she said, she is still alive, and she will never talk about what she did during the war. We know she was in Austria. We know she got kicked out of Austria, had to come back to Portugal. We don't really know any more than that. So I, I told him what I, what I knew, and he confronted her, and she admitted she had been involved in the July 20th plot. And so one of my other sons was working in um, Europe, and he was going, his girlfriend was on this very long conflict, was in Portugal, so he wanted to go see her in Portugal. He'd been, um, he's a writer, and he had been uh, uh, on the Daily Bruin at UCLA, so he knew how to do interviews. So I said, would you interview this woman? So he did this, this interview with Mafalda, which is a wonderful interview. She had been involved with uh, the July 20th plot. She had been arrested and was tortured by the Gestapo, but um, she got out. So um, in Salazar interview and brought her back. Uh, this is someone you may recognize. Anybody recognize him? Teaches down the road at Harvard. He uh, is Herb Kelman. He was a Jewish uh, refugee, uh, emigre from the Third Reich, uh, living in Austria during the war, and a uh, very interesting man. I was hoping he could be here tonight, but he has a, a Middle East uh, <coughs> conflict situation he's dealing with. All right, so in all, we had about 50 speakers. Some were people that the students interviewed. Some were people that I interviewed just on my own or through the Ethics Center. Um, so we had over 50. We ran, ranged from World War II refugees, Japanese internees in the United States. I mentioned someone from the Armenian Genocide. She remembered, even at six, people do tend to remember these traumatic memories that her grandfather had his head chopped off because he wouldn't give up his Bible. She ran out and grabbed the Bible. It's, it has his blood on it. It's still in the family. She wouldn't, be, wouldn't talk much about the genocide itself, but she talked about how you recover afterward. We had people who were involved in the Mau Mau revolt, a um, man who is often spoken of as a possible uh, Nobel laureate from Africa. Uh, Nguji was interviewed by us. He now teaches at Irvine. People from the Vietnamese War, War, both Vietnamese soldiers in the South, American soldiers, civil wars in Lebanon, El Salvador, Nicaragua. Um, a lot of surprising number of Khmer Rouge survivors, and one of the students is actually doing interviews with people in her family as an uh, honors thesis with me. I'm going to try to get her to do a little book on it, because they're incredible stories. Um, one girl said her father, she never knew, had been, she knew the father, but she never knew that he had been uh, tortured by Idi Amin, and she said, I always wondered why he gave so much money to Uganda, and she said, I thought, why don't you give it to me instead, but she said, now I understand, she's very sweet. Um, people from Iraq, Afghanistan, under the Russians, and people from the Islamic Republic of Iran, so that's the people that we have. So, <clears throat> what are our findings, basically? <laughs> this is Chloe's PowerPoint, she said, they're boring what you do. Uh, we had presented some of these, I don't know if they gave a handout or not, just summary form, um, this is all in the book that's just, just out, I think, this week. Um, so the first thing we looked at, we kind of read through these, and I wanted to try to think about what are the common themes that we see. I mean, we're doing science is very, very general sciences. Are there things that emerge? Um, and one of the things that you find is the idea that there's a kind of innate, universal, instinctual drive to survive, and that everybody has this. Um, but we thought this is a kind of very Freudian thing. But I thought that it's possible that it also might work against it, that you would reduce, against creeping your humanity, it might reduce people to creatures who'd be willing really pretty much to do anything to survive. We found that people do in fact have a survival drive, but that the evidence is very mixed in terms of the effect that it has on their humanity. Um, these are a couple quotes just to give you a feel for it. Um, a South Vietnamese soldier who said he knew he'd have to kill some of his relatives if he met them or they'd try to kill him. He was uh, arrested after the war. He was in a re-education camp, which he said was the worst part of the experience. He tried to escape on a boat twice, once with his wife, a uh, second time without his wife. He left his wife and a child there. And he did manage to make it that time, but it took him about two years to get her back. Uh, and then my student was born afterwards in the United States. And he said, I got to do what I got to do in order to survive. I just had to do it. There was no question. Um, Rhea, a woman who went through the Nicaraguan Civil War, said, I had to stay strong. I knew I just had to. So this was a kind of, kind of raw urge to survive that I think uh, everybody tends to have. Um, does it uh, actually reduce people to creatures who will do anything to survive? Um, I didn't, 
the evidence was less clear on that. Um, we did have people who talked a little bit about that. And uh, Sarah, who was a Khmer Rouge survivor, said, I didn't want to die. You lied so you were able to survive. I lied a lot. If you didn't lie, then you would die. Everybody lied. Um, and this was very common. If you had, you had to do what you had to do, and it was OK to violate some of the, thing, the ethical principles you'd grown up with. One of the questions that you find is how you deal with these memories. I found in my earlier work on the Holocaust that a lot of people would simply repress things. They would divide things. Most people, initially at least, said, I've closed the door. I put a do not disturb sign on it. I got on with my life. And then people would deal with it when it was ready for them to deal with it. And I'm always impressed with the um, human mind's ability to handle what you can handle. I've seen this in my own family. My brother died in 1973 of leukemia when he was in his early 20s. And it was years before my mother could even speak his name. And she told me about five years ago, so it's been a long time, that she has a recurring nightmare that he is angry with her, and that's why she hasn't seen him for so long. But he's, a, he's, uh, he's in college, and he won't come home and see her because he's mad at her. And I thought it's, you know, it was sad, it was touching, but it was amazing how the human mind is dealing. She can't let him die. I think a lot of people went through this with, with memory, and so I think sometimes repressing difficult memories will inhibit constructing a happy life afterwards. Um, but, and the theory is that those who can emotionally engage their traumatic memories will fare better than those who do not. I'm not really sure that that's, that's true. I found I couldn't tell from some of the people we talked with um, in terms of being happy, being able to establish lives and go on, whether or not uh, just repressing something and saying, can't deal with that, is it better or not? I talked with a psychoanalyst who was Dutch who had uh, rescued people during the war. And she said she'd give me the interview and she wasn't going to talk to anybody else. She didn't want to talk about things like that. And something came up during the interview and I said, well, how did you deal with this in analysis? Because to be a psychoanalyst, you have to go through analysis. And she said, well, I didn't mention it. And I was a little taken aback. I wasn't quite sure what to say. Um, really try hard not to be judgmental or make faces like that. So I said, um, what does that say to you as a psychoanalyst? And she said, I wasn't ready to deal with it. And I thought, OK, she wasn't ready to deal with it. So this is obviously something you find in a lot of, a lot of people. These are two couple here. This is Frank, uh, who was in World War II. Uh, we just didn't talk about it. It was one of those things you repress. That's how you cope. To me, it was a chapter. When the chapter was over, you closed it and put it behind you. And that, I think, really seemed to be the way a lot of people dealt with things. Another internee, um, we had a lot of internees in different in different courses, sometimes the students say one grandmother wouldn't shut up, and the other said she hardly wanted to talk about it. But most people are willing to talk about it, partly with grandchildren. I think it's safer than talking with their children sometimes. You and your siblings never talked about what went on in the camps. No, we didn't. Plus, my brother was in Vietnam. I think that's where he went. He should have known where brother was. Um, he never talks about it. He never says anything about that war. He pushes it out of his mind, too. He doesn't mention anything. A lot of people didn't talk about it. They never say anything. I had a woman I talked with who had a very well-known um, social scientist and just died about five years ago. Her, she was German-Jewish. She came to this country. Her father wouldn't leave. He was sure nothing would happen to him. I did the interview with her in 1994, and she said that um, she, the Red Cross wrote to her after World War II and told her they had information on what had happened to her father in Washington, and she could go down and get it. And she said, I've been meaning to go down. I haven't had time to do it yet. And I thought, 50 years, and you haven't had time to do it. She isn't ready to. So I think that that happens a lot. Um, OK, so here we have another question, which um, is interesting to me, since I was raised by two control freaks. Um, if you have control over your life, you presumably are happier, right? This is something that um, is, you find in a lot of literature. When environment, situational factors, and personality combine to provide a sense of control over one's destiny, surviving with one's humanity intact will be more likely. This kind of relates closely to what we philosophers call a sense of agency, feeling you're someone who can take charge of actions. We didn't find this confirmed at all. Um, we found the counter effects were often indicated, um, and that fatalism is something that was often much more important. And fatalism had a very interesting kind of um, play in here. These are just people on the left who, who have argued this. Um, Sebastian, who was a student who had come back to college after the Iraq War, said he had felt a profound sense of powerlessness and fear and pain. Reza, who was an Afghan, these are all pseudonyms, by the way, unless people have asked to have their real names used. Reza was um, 
an Afghan who lived through the Russian invasion and left afterwards. He said that he described being caught up in a very elaborate power game that engulfed his country, tossing the Afghan people around like pawns. So most people felt that they that uh, fatalism was uh, helped them, um, and only one person. This is Naguji, who had lived through the Mau Mau revolution. He said he, he that he became a writer. He was performing. He was. Um, putting on plays out in the bush with people, and he was using Gikiyu as the language, because that's what they spoke. And he said they didn't, they didn't speak Swahili or English, because those were the language of the colonial oppressors, he felt. And he was arrested for doing this. He was put into uh, prison, and he wrote the first book in Gikiyu on toilet paper. He got a little piece of paper. They would give you a piece of paper if you were willing to write a confession, um, give you a pencil, I'm sorry, if you were willing to write a confession. And so at night he would get toilet paper and he would write the stories out that he wanted to do and he kept them and then he actually published it in Gikiyo. And he said doing this was a, a form of resistance. And he said you have to dig deep in yourself and find a form of resistance that can keep you mentally and spiritually alive. I've heard same things I saw at Amr Sadat talked about being in solitary confinement, how you had to put your mind someplace else so you weren't freed. So I think sometimes people can find a sense of control in another way, but most of the people didn't. Instead what they did, um, something very closely related to agency and fatalism. Um, theory that I assumed would be more um, to the fair, which, to the front, would be um, the idea that those who see themselves as weak and helpless will fare less well than those who see themselves as able to take charge of their lives and effect change. An alternative explanation and interpretation is that those who lack strong sense of agency actually fare better, finding the lack of control less of a shock. We found that the whole idea of agency was not confirmed, that the inordinate needs for control may actually work against you. This is just a counter hypothesis that we came up with. But these are some of the quotes that suggested this. This is an American soldier in Iraq. I was really afraid. The way I managed dealing with that kind of stress was debilitating, sitting there thinking, oh, pardon my language here, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. So I was like, fuck it, I'm already dead. So I can just stop worrying about that and just worry about what I have to do. Frank said very much the same same thing, and so I had a chance to talk with him in a little more detail about it, and he said, the idea was, it's, he said, soldiers in every war, it's like, if your number's up, your number's up. And he said, that gives you, it keeps, it lowers the stress level for you, just that, well, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And he said, I adopted that through the rest of my life. So that was an interesting finding we had not expected. Um, one of the things that we thought was very important is the idea that I first ran across in Bruno Bettelheim's uh, autobiography, intellectual autobiography, called The Informed Heart, which is a very interesting book. And Beckelheim is a very controversial speaker. But in it, he describes, uh, Beckelheim was a psychoanalyst, ended up at the University of Chicago. He'd been arrested before he was really in, heavily involved in analysis. And, um, but it had to do some, he was an art student and had had to study Jungian's theory for the, relating to art. He was arrested for, um, and put in concentration camp briefly and then was, was freed um, in celebration of Hitler's birthday. He could buy people out. Um, and one of the things he described in the camp was a woman who had been a very well-known dancer. And she was being let in to be gassed and was naked, was rather thin at that point because they didn't feed them well. And one of the guards recognized her and taunted her very cruelly and sadistically saying, uh, well, look, you were such a great dancer. Come and dance for us now and see what, you know, see what that'll do for you. And so he pulls her out and makes her dance. And she gets close enough to him that she gets his gun and she kills him. She, of course, has shot herself, but she was going to die anyway. And Bettelheim's theory of this is that linking with her, for, with her former self broke the kind of systematic attempt that the Nazis had to turn people into uh, animals who would do anything that they they tried the the systematic um, midnight raids, the systematic coming in the middle of night, scaring people was all part of a, a kind of totalitarian theory to control people, and that by by just doing this horrible sadistic act, it reconnected her with her former self enough so that she had the courage to go and, and kill him and kind of establish something else. So this was the theory that we we um, 
check to see whether or not people who were able to maintain humanity, maintain a kind of continuity, saying I'm still the same person, even though I'm undergoing this horrible experience, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with me, would actually fare better. Um, and we found this was very strongly confirmed. Um, one of the women, uh, I mentioned the Bethlehem story, is a woman who was from Nicaragua, and she, she talked about um, the interview experience herself. And one of the things we discovered when we looked into the literature in PTSD is that if you actually talk about, uh, talk about the experience, sometimes it alleviates some, it helps you. So telling Andre and my daughter about my experiences was not as difficult as I'd originally thought it might be. They received it very well and were actually incredibly surprised I never shared that information with them. So to be able to share that information now so openly and freely to someone who isn't even my child, because she was talking with students, means I've accepted it as part of who I am. I don't know when that happened, but it must have happened sometime when I discovered who I truly was as a person. And we found that in a lot of interviews, that people would actually thank us for giving them the opportunity to talk about the experience. Uh, one of the big questions that we have in ethics, I think we're going to talk about later, is the extent to which the situation, luck, the environment will influence our behavior. This you see, of course, through um, Adler's work, Bettelheim's work, and probably best well known in um, some of the, the Stanford prison experiments or the uh, Milgram experiments on authoritarianism or done at Yale. Um, and this is the basic the idea that in forming a link to a pre-war self, situational factors will play as critical of a role as underlying personality strength. It's the social environment will exert a, a crucial influence on moral action. We found this was kind of mixed. Um, one of the people, Laura uh, Hillman, who was on Schindler's List, said, students will ask me, how come you stayed alive when your family and the six million did not? I could never give an answer to that. Why? I don't know myself. I don't know. It was a set of circumstances. It was luck. It was where I stood at a given time and what time of year it was. A lot of people said it was just chance. I was just lucky. They took somebody else. They didn't take me. Um, that was the kind of thing that we found often. Okay, how about the idea that people, um, this comes very much out of um, her, um, Victor Frankl's work, who was very, uh, was also another person who was incarcerated, found that the Freudian uh, psychoanalysis that he'd been trained in didn't really work for him, but he uh, lost his wife, he lost pretty much everybody in his family, I think except his sister. And he came out with a, a book that called, um, it's the idea that if you can find meaning in suffering, then it will be okay. If you can, that will facilitate keeping your humanity. And the ability to feel a sense of control, learn from new experiences, both are hallmarks of the existential energy that's central to the theory that uh, Sal Matty developed called hardiness, um, may affect how one keeps in touch with one's humanity. We found this was actually true, that there were a lot of people who talked about how um, they learned something from it. Well, it was a horrible experience, but it made me a better person, or I learned something and I got something out. And that kind of helped them accept it. This may be how control enters. I don't know. This is beginning work. This was kind of an extraordinary quote. There's a woman um, named Kimberly who was a Khmer Rouge survivor. Would I go back and change time? No. This has given me the knowledge to understand we are all human. Some of us understand that better than others. Some can forgive better than others, and some people have more hatred than us. The war and living through a society like that, the Khmer Rouge, you learn how to end up on your feet, so you have to find peace in yourself. If you don't have that, you cannot have peace. So no, there's nothing I want to change. I'm blessed for what I have. I thank God for what he put me through, that I was able to feel it, see it, taste it, and now I know what life is all about. It's a very extraordinary interview. If you do get the book, I encourage you to read this chapter. Um, okay, so how about self-esteem and continuity? That's one thing that's supposed to help. Uh, you find this throughout all the uh, post-traumatic stress disorder literature. The idea is that retaining self-esteem increases the probability of surviving war, that people with high self-esteem are more likely to withstand and recover from the shocks of war. Doing so will entail a range of diverse mechanisms, denial sometimes, focusing on family, friends, uh, post-traumatic routines even. People find that if you go through a trauma of any kind, um, simply reading the paper in the morning with a cup of coffee seems to help people a lot. Something that they've done uh, seems to be very comforting again. It's getting back to normal. We found a lot of this in the interviews that we had. Uh, Herb Kalman, who is himself a social psychologist, and it's almost cheating to do an interview with somebody like Herb because he sort of answers so many questions in the language that academics use. Uh, um, he's an extraordinary human being, and if you don't know him, you should get to know him. He's now, I think, in his 90s and is emeritus, but he 
still is very active professionally, and he's devoted his whole life to trying to understand conflict and conflict resolution. He's been very involved in a lot of things in the Middle East, um, which is why he isn't here tonight. And he went through psychoanalysis quite early when he got out of the war, and he said um, that one of the things that helped him was that he and his sister were members of a Zionist group, and that was very important for all sorts of reasons. Perhaps most important to what we're talking about now, it buffered my sense of self-esteem in such a way that the whole part of the experience, not the Holocaust at that time, not my whole Nazi experience, none of this threatened my self-esteem in any way. And he went on and said, look, I've been body frisked when I left the country. This is not pleasant for a 14-year-old boy. But he said, it didn't damage my sense of who I was. That was intact. And I think that the, uh, the, the uh, Zionist group, it's like, I'm a member of this group. Jews aren't bad. Jews are good. They're just, they're crazy. It's not us. Um, OK, how do people deal with blame and guilt? These are very uh, closely related. And of course, one of the questions is whether or not surviving, addressing survivor guilt helps people live, lead productive lives that are happy after the war. We found this was mixed, but mostly confirmed. Um, Laura uh, Hillman talked a lot about this. She said this was a big problem for her, and she gets depressed even now. But she said, um, I consider it my duty to speak until I lo no longer can, so that we will be remembered. Why did I survive? I survived, and the book will tell you why. To remember, yes. Now, it's interesting, Laura had a son who went to MIT. Um, she said they had, she and her husband, she met her husband in concentration camp. He was giving the food, and he'd give her a little bit more food. And the title of her book is called I Promise You a Lilac Tree, because she talked about having a lilac tree in her home in Germany, and she really missed that. And he said, I'll give you a normal life after the war. Uh, they, I think they got married in the camp, actually. Um, and people said, this is no place for love. And she said, this is a place where you need love. Um, and she said they had not told their child uh, much about it. He, they talked a little bit about it. He had, um, I think he went to boarding school and then came here. And she said he called them and said, I saw a movie on the Holocaust, and it doesn't look as bad as what you know, I've heard to different places, and I want to know what you think. And she said, we had to talk with him about it then. And she's, she's just talking about how you deal with it, but she said part of what was important for her was in terms of dealing with blame, is if she could go on, have a child, establish a happy life, that was in some ways living for the people who had not gotten to do it. So it was very important that she lived her life correctly. Uh, emotional support, very important for people. We found people who could get emotional support from their uh, family, even from political groups like the Zionist group, the religious groups. This was really helps cope with loss and reestablish or maintain humanity. We found that very strongly confirmed. Um, a lot of people talked about their families. Um, it's one of the chapters we've called is the fundamental thing supply. It's very simple. It's very obvious. Love. Love for my family. Because they gave me the love, I was able to love others. And I just told the story about Laura with friends said, this is no place for love. But she said, those things help me stay strong. They help me stay human. And so what do we make of all these stories? One of the people said to us, when I tell this story, it's not just because I heard it. I experienced it. I'm not just saying it to tell someone's story. I tell my story because I'm passing on my knowledge. I've been there. I felt it. It's your choice to decide how to use it. So I asked the kids, OK, what do you make of this? And I think that um, I think they all felt that it was a very good learning experience, that it was something, particularly because it was a friend of theirs, that they were very connected to the person. It helped them understand the person more, helped them be grateful for what they had. And we talked about the end, um, and sort of brings us back to the initial story I told about Enrico Fermi, that what is it that social science can do in, in all of this when you're faced with something like war? Um, we find a lot of wartime stories. We've had a lot of policy issues. Obviously, there are lots of books that, and movies that glamorize war. Uh, what is the place that social science has that fiction can't? Um, and I think that fiction gives the author voice, and that social science tries to give voice to the speaker. I think the most important thing I've done in my career is just basically listen to other people. Um, shut up, stay out of the way, and let them talk, and let them take you where they want to take you, not where you think you may want to go. Um, and I think that the... Um, I was struck by the contrast between a lot of the books that are written on war by policymakers uh, who are trying to justify the wars they started, or at least colluded in. I was very uh, fond of Ithiel de Solapool, who set up the political science department here at MIT uh, and was involved in the Vietnam War, which I disagreed with him about. Um, but it, I think that 
if you listen to people, you can hear the complex aspects of it. But one of the things that we didn't find, which is what was interesting, none of this kind of jingoism, swashbuckling, um, there was no kind of stories that you find out of, um, you know, gone with the wind, um, in uh, the kind of, what you see at the beginning of that, everybody's racing off to kind of get into battle before the uh, war is over and they, you know, they lose the chance for glory. Uh, you can see it in um, All Quiet on the Western Front. They start out in Germany where the school kids want to go out. And um, one of the most moving things I've seen was going to um, look at these World War I cemeteries in um, Flanders. And I went with my oldest son who had been studying German. And he said, where is the German cemetery? And I hadn't even thought about that. So we looked around. Nobody wanted to speak French to me. Nobody would speak English, and nobody speak German with him. So we finally found somebody who in Flemish kind of directed us to this huge place. Has anybody ever been there? Do you know what it looks like? It's huge. Uh, it's, you know, much bigger than this room. And they have oak trees, which were planted around 1920, 1921, so they're big. Nobody else was there, and they're mass graves. And they have uh, plaques, which they say the name of this, the person, how old they were, what was their rank, and what they did before they were involved in the war. So you have it each grave, and it'll have maybe 20 or 30 of these plaques. And I'm standing at one, and there's, there are two statues. One is of a man just looking absolutely vacant. And the other is a woman with a shawl around her face looking down like great pain. And they're beautiful uh, bronze statues by Kathy Colwitz, who I always think of as my mother has a, a sketch of hers in her bedroom with a mother holding a child. And I didn't realize Colwitz did these kind of busts. Um, and so I took a picture of the bust, and then I took a picture of one of the plaques. And as I focused the camera, I realized that one of the names on the plaques was Colwitz. He was 19, and he was a student when he went into the war. Didn't find anything uh, about that in the stories. Nobody ever said, well, one person talked about we're, um, the Iraq war was we're doing it for greater good. Uh, collateral damage for greater good. Everybody else used phrases stuck in the mud in the middle of a civil war. It was a, a young girl whose dad had been in the Sandinista, uh, her, whose father was in the Somoza government. They, she and her mother were try and, uh, trying to get away and uh, they're in a car, and their car gets stuck, and this guy comes out of the woods with a big Uzi on or some gun on his shoulder, and he puts some wood under and gets the car started. So they offer him a ride into Managua, and he's fine. They're talking, and the mother's slowly realizing he's Sandinista, hoping the kids will shut up and not say anything. They're going by. They see a Jeep where there are some bodies that are actually burned as they're standing there watching them. And she says, um, you know, he has a pass, and he gets them through, and then they never see him again. And they flew to Los Angeles on a plane and never went back. But she said, there we were stuck in the mud of a civil war. Another phrase, uh, wars that cons easily constitute the worst experiences of a lifetime. People who saw too much, who carry bad memories and bad feelings, who live the rest of their lives as damaged goods. A lot of people describe themselves as damaged goods, not happy feelings. At the very best, collateral damage is justified and then rarely by a greater good. So one of the things that uh, we were struck by when we started reading things, um, war is hell, war is all hell. And there are many quotes from Sherman talking about how you people don't know what war is like. You think it's glorifying, but it really isn't. And so what I'd like to conclude with is a quote from a soldier uh, who was in the Battle of the Bulge. And he said, the enormity of it all tended to reduce everything else in life in a kind of footnote. And I was spending the year at the Radcliffe Institute um, as I was finishing this book. And there was a Mexican filmmaker who was married to a Canadian woman. And they had a child. And she had a child from an earlier marriage. He said, as soon as they, uh, her her uh, child went off to college. He wanted to move back to Mexico. He said, and people in Canada, they have all these house and garden TV shows. There's even a station called HGTV, which actually has Love It or List It, which Hillary Clinton likes, one of her favorite shows. They buy shows, houses, and decide if they're going to renovate them. And he said, all people in Canada talk about it, their gardens or their houses or material goods. He said, people in Mexico don't have any of that. So they talk about real things. And I was thinking about that when I was thinking about this quote. And it seemed to me that in some ways, I can understand that. On the other hand, now that I'm older, I and you know, have gone through traumas in my own life, living, you know, losing my brother. Um, I think sometimes if you've gone through something like this, you want to live in the footnote. Um, and so I concluded the book this way. Their forest, if you try to step back and look at the forest for the trees, is very dark, it's very primordial and dangerous, which no soldiers cheer, no crowds exalt. Our speakers, ordinary people all, reach out to us, exuding revulsion and the desire to suppress the memory of their war. 
searching to make sense of their experience, yearning to close the chapter and move on back to the blessed mundane of the everyday, away from an experience so searing that the enormity of it all does tend to reduce the rest of life to a blessed footnote in which they hope we can all permanently reside. So that's where I've kind of interpret the silences, the things that people don't talk about, sometimes are the most important. So we're collecting more uh, interviews. If any of you have courses that you are interested in using these uh, kinds of tools as a pedagogical technique, I can recommend it. I think the students benefit a lot from it. I, um, the Ethics Center website is up there, and they're going to be put, most of them, are, uh, some of them are already up in the Vaughan archives. Uh, and I encourage you to, to look at them, use them for your own research if you're interested, and to ask your students to do some similar. I think it's a good learning technique. Thank you. I'd like now to introduce to you um, Kieran Satia, who's recently joined the MIT Department of Philosophy after 13 years on the faculty at the University of Pittsburgh. The author of Knowing Right from Wrong, Professor Satia explores the importance of love and the value of human life and ethical thought, and he's graciously agreed to share with us a response to tonight's talk. Well, let me see, is this, people can hear me okay, yeah. right? Yes, so um, first of all, let me thank Professor Monroe for this fascinating talk and for her extraordinary work, both in, in the book on which the talk was based and in her pioneering studies of human altruism, altruistic motivation, uh, which includes some equally memorable uh, uh, moving interviews. In the interviews we heard about today, survivors of war, genocide, ethnic cleansing, and political oppression were asked, how did you preserve your humanity in conditions of war or reclaim it afterwards? Framed that way, the question presupposes that the audience did retain his or her humanity. But as we saw in some of Kristen's uh, studies, especially in connection with the will to survive, uh, that wasn't always entirely clear. The situation was more complicated. There can be moral costs to surviving the war, surviving war situations psychologically intact. And that's the starting point for two questions um, I wanted to hear, hear more about. One that I'm going to mention briefly is broadly methodological. So in drawing conclusions about what helps us to retain our humanity in the face of war or genocide, it would be, it would be very interesting to study not only people who do or seem to, but people who don't. Uh, do they differ in their appeal to fatalism or the will to survive or the other factors on Kristen's list of hypotheses. Um, is there work out there that helps to answer those questions? So that's one thing I, I'm really curious about. Um, the second question I'll spend a bit more time on is moral or ethical. Uh, and one way to approach it is to ask uh, what's meant by humanity in the context of this kind of research. And there's sort of a rough distinction between two kinds of things we could focus on. On the one hand, we could focus on what enables people to survive psychologically, to flourish or to achieve happiness, question about human well-being, what, what enables them to remain psychologically intact. And on the other hand, we could ask uh, what helps people to maintain their moral decency. And those are not exactly the same, and there's potential for conflict between them. So again, that was something Kristen noted in connection with the will to survive, uh, that factors that enable someone to hold themselves together might be morally compromising. But the issue is really more general than that. So it, really, it makes a real difference whether what we're asking for are means to, to happiness in the aftermath of war or means to moral decency in the face of it. One way to think about that contrast a bit more is to think about uh, phenomena like the role of dehumanization in war. So military psychologists often report that it takes work to break through people's psychological inhibitions to causing violence in order to make effective soldiers. And dehumanization is a strategy for doing that. So the more we conceive others as non or subhuman and place them outside the realm of moral protection, the more 
easy it's going to be to engage in violence without psych internal psychological conflict. If you think of representations of Japanese as insects or lice during World War II, or Nazi depictions of Jews as untermenschen, or Hutus in Rwanda describing Tutsis as cockroaches or snakes. In virtually every major genocide or war, dehumanization has played a pivotal role. So this sort of negative claim that uh, dehumanization can play a role in lifting inhibitions towards violence, broadly consistent with Kristen's earlier work on altruism, altruists um, in her research seem to be motivated by an especially vivid sense of shared humanity. So how does this connect with, with the topic she was talking about today? The question is whether losing one's moral sense through dehumanization might be a way to preserve your equanimity or your, your sort of felt happiness, your psychological integrity in that sense, in times of war. In a way, it, it could be that another hypothesis to add to Kristen's list is that one effective way to preserve your felt happiness would be to compromise morally by dehumanization. It's not one she talks about, perhaps because it's so obviously morally fraught, but it is a hypothesis we could test. Similar points apply to other uh, military tactics, like uh, emphasizing deference to authority, where that deference is treated as a moral excuse. So the idea that lower ranking officers are not responsible for what they do under the command of their superiors. A principle that I think is morally ambiguous at best, but maybe a way of uh, maybe accepting it is a way to insulate oneself from guilt. And Kristen does talk in, in uh, the bits of the book I've looked at about survivor guilt, but less about guilt about wrongdoing. Both strategies, I think, both of those phenomena illustrated in the case of Frank, one of the, the interviewees she talked about. His interview in the book describes the dehumanization of Japanese soldiers during World War II and his involvement in that. And although he didn't participate directly in killing, he was not a soldier on the, the field, he talks very sympathetically about the idea of obedience to authority as a moral justification. Uh, he doesn't have moral doubts about the dropping of the atomic bomb. And I suspect that in re those respects, he's not atypical. So I've been talking about dehumanization and deference to authority as potential means to psychological stability or self-preservation that are morally questionable, sort of to pull apart these two, two topics of preserving one's felt happiness and what is conducive to moral decency in war. Um, what about the psychological mechanisms and strategies that Kristen did study in the book? What's their moral valence? Are they, are they morally unproblematic? Uh, I think that's just an interesting question. It's really, it's not entirely clear to me. It, it would depend on details that it would be interesting to hear, hear more about. So one thing is that many of her interviewees stressed not only support from, but a focused concern on their family, the need to save their family, as a crucial motivation in surviving war. And nothing wrong with that in itself, but it might reflect a narrowing of concern from other people in general to the immediate circle of one's family, a sort of way of limiting one's emotional exposure to the horrors of war. And in that case, it's understandable, but, but potentially morally dangerous. Well, think about the fatalism. That was one of the really interesting uh, techniques that came out of Kristen's studies, uh, that fatalism can operate as a psychological defense. So giving up on what's out of your control could be consistent with the full exertion of energy to control what you can. It may be a, 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 mat a matter of just accepting the irrevocable facts of your circumstance, not futilely fighting against them, as in sort of Stoic or Buddhist conceptions of happiness. But it might also involve a premature willingness to, to, to deny or limit one's own responsibility or to underestimate what's within one's power. And then it's more morally questionable. So how exactly those mechanisms operate, fatalism and the tendency to focus on one's narrow circle, are empirical questions for Kristen uh, that I'm very interested in. I think the point I'm trying to bring out is that the answers to them make a moral difference. Even where there's no particular conflict between the means to happiness on the one hand and moral decency on the other, it's notable that many of the strategies Kristen talks about are in themselves morally neutral. So we could imagine the happiness of a surviving member of the Khmer Rouge, or a case like uh, the Nazi Gustav Wagner who was reported to have said he was arrested um, in South America where he had fled in, at the age of 68, that whatever happened next, he would not be the real loser. His only regret was that Germany didn't win the war, and he said, I thoroughly enjoyed Brazil, and I didn't think about the past. 
It's a very chilling case. From one perspective, it will be a perfectly good case for Kristen's research. Uh, we could ask, how did he manage to maintain his happiness in the face of what he went through? Did he rely on his high self-esteem, on fatalism, or the love and support of his family, and so on? So I think there's something interesting here is that when we're first presented with Kristen's question, what helps people to keep their humanity in the face of war, the end to which we're investigating the means can look unequivocally positive. But as we separate or pull apart felt happiness on the one hand from moral decency on the other, and the more we focus on the former, the, mo the more complicated it is how uh, positive this goal really is. Again, if we assume the moral innocence of the people we're studying, the contrast may not seem deep. Uh, but as I've been trying to bring out, the means to happiness are distinct from and may even conflict with the means to humanity in the moral sense. I think there's an interesting contrast here with Kristen's earlier work on altruism where there's sort of obvious practical interest in understanding the possibility and the psychological roots of altruistic motivation. It's much more complicated why we should be interested in what helps people retain their sense of well-being in the face of war if well-being is conceived in morally neutral terms. I mean, we might be interested because we want to know how to get more tours of duty out of soldiers. Um, uh, we might also care about things like the potential moral costs. So I want the, the sort of a different question we could shift to, or a way of making explicit that dimension of the question by asking directly, so what enables people to maintain their moral decency in terrible conditions, or to preserve their own well-being in ways that uh, don't mute their moral sense. And I'm interested in, in hearing more from Kristen about sort of how her interviews bear on that more specific kind of question. Um, I'm gonna end with just some speculations about it that might provoke responses that, that um, I would love to hear. So if I were to speculate on the threats to moral decency in harsh conditions, I would start with phenomena like the ones I did start with, things like dehumanization and the encouragement of deference to authority. And I'd be interested in the resources of situationism, the idea uh, which Kristen mentioned, that people's circumstances have a larger effect on how they behave than their enduring character does. That was one point at which I was unsure of Kristen's evidence or how, how to test the hypothesis. She found only mixed support for situationism. But given the methodology of interviewing people, in a way, that's what we should expect. So many of the hypotheses she was testing uh, concern psychological processes that would probably show up in direct interviews, so repression or an intense desire to survive or deep connections with one's family. That's not so true of the situational effects described by psychologists like Zimbardo and, and Milgram. There you would expect that the proposed explanation of people's behavior would be opaque to the subject, not something that would be confirmed or refuted by direct testimony. So, if I were asked to sort of start thinking through the question about moral decency in particular and how to enable people to maintain it in times of war, I would be interested in, in how to control the situations in which they find themselves to limit these kinds of situational effects and in how, how far understanding or teaching people about the situational effects can help one to resist them. As I said, this is armchair speculation. What would be really interesting is to hear what Kristen thinks about these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Those are great questions. I wish I had answers. Um, I gave a, um, uh, the, I mean, just the last uh, comment that you made about kind of a controlled experiment. I gave a talk at the University of Michigan named after several people, one of whom was a very old man who came. And he's, I won't tell you who he is. He's very well known. And he um, <clears throat> was, was talking about the work and how interesting it was. And he said at lunch, that he had been a uh, conscientious objector during the war and that he had um, been in charge as a psychologist of doing some experiments on people to see how little food people could live on um, and still function. And he, he talks about these, it was very interesting because we had similar experiments in Poland and then he's describing the experiments he's doing here and I, I realized I was kind of I said, what he's talking about is he took a group of people and he fed them like 300 calories a day to see what happened to them. And I'm sitting there, I realize I'm going into interview mode, which is like uh, repeating. So you took 
a group of people and you fed them 300 calories a day. Yes, he says, you know, and, and I said, this replicated an experiment. And, you know, he said, yeah, it's really exciting because he had the chance. And I think, gee, Willie Curse, let me out of here. You know, and this guy is taking other conscientious objectors and starving them to death to see how they happen. So some of these things are things you would never perform if you did have the opportunity to. So um, it's, it's a kind of interesting research. I was talking with a friend who was a, an astrophysicist. She said, we have no experiments because, you know, it's like the volcano goes off or it doesn't. We don't set up the conditions before. So you know, very different situations. So that we kind of turned this, you know, the way social scientists like to do it. You read a literature, you come up with hypotheses, you find a group and you look at it. We did this exactly backwards. So that we interviewed people and then we looked at the interviews, which we had no idea where they were going to go. And then we kind of found what things stuck out and what literature that told us about. So it's a kind of reverse phenomenon. OK, having said that, um, I think there are two kind of big questions that you raise. First, the first one is uh, how you structure the interviews and what you say. And an obvious first question is, what does it mean to be humanity mean to you? I'm not going to try to define it. I don't think I think that's way above my pay grade. I am just a social scientist, and the philosophers do this much better than I do. What I did find that the people I talked with for the altruism ser uh, survey tended to think that ethics had something to do with human flourishing. Now, that raises the other question that you, you talk about. If you conceptualize ethics as basically having to do with human well-being, and if what happens during humanization is that people distance and dehumanize people, then they're outside what Marion Smiley calls the community of concern. So they're not human anymore. And one of the interviews I showed um, yesterday morning in a talk I gave was with a man um, who talked with a concentration guard in Upper Silesia. And he was in a camp because he'd been saving some people. And he said, did you ever have to kill people? And the guy says, yes, I had to shoot six Jews once. But it's hard when you get such an order in the authority. But you have to be hard when you do this. And he said, besides, they weren't human anymore. And I said, that's the secret. You, you call them them. They're not us. Um, and you distance them. You take away soap. You, their Jew becomes dirty, you take away food, they become flesh-colored skeleton, it's easy to kill them then, so you're putting them out of their misery. So I think that um, this, is, this is a fundamental problem. If you define ethics as human flourishing, and if what people do when they dehumanize people, which I think they do in every war, one of the people I interviewed said it's easier to shoot at the yellow gooks, which is a phrase we used during the Vietnam War, for those of you who are not old enough to remember it, um, than another farm boy just like yourself. And I think that always goes on. Um, so that I, I don't think I have an answer to this kind of the tension between dehumanization and ethics. So, but let me go back to the first, which is a simpler question. Um, and I think in the I'm teaching this course again in um, winter term in 2015. And one of the things I'm going to do is revive the question. So I'm going to say, can you go in and ask people when they talk about your war, um, the, think about how people, as they remember the war and look around them at people, did they notice that there were some people who seemed to maintain their humanity in these harsh conditions better than others? And what does it mean to you to retain humanity? Uh, and try to get them to see what that thinks of them. And then what are the factors that you think contributed to this? And can you talk about your own case? What do you think? So I think we're going to reshift the question, which I think I'll get at some of those uh, questions a little bit. So, but the idea of uh, defining humanity, I think it's, that's a big question. I think it's not just survival. I don't think that when we use the term, most of the people thought that, but uh, we were trying to pick up what they actually thought. I think it does have something to do with moral decency, and I think it's just isn't happiness. Uh, so I think it's a little bit more of that. OK, so. Um, some of the other questions. Accepting of authority. Um, you mentioned that Franks tended to do that. Actually, Frank talked about the bomb as being justified in cost-benefit terms. A lot of the people did. It wasn't just the authority said this. But there are some people that I think do. They use that, uh, perpetrators. I haven't spent much time with perpetrators. I did interview some Nazis for the book that I did, um, Ethics in an Age of Terror and Genocide. And I really didn't like the experience. It's like, I'm done. I'm going back to the altruists. I like them. They're nicer people. And I had uh, Phil Zimbardo, actually, is, um, um, is very good friends with a good friend of mine, Rose McDermott, who teaches at Brown. And he has uh, a man named, um, I guess I can give his name, Steiner. Um, who was someone I had heard of because Otto Springer had known him. And Otto describes uh, one of the interviews, a very difficult interview with Otto. He describes being um, on a, 
on a death march for the Camp Rosa, Gross Rosen. And he said, I didn't know what it was. I asked one of the guards, and he told me what it was. And he said, I realized that one of my friends survived. He mentioned her, his name was Steiner, um, survived the march. He said, I might have seen him, and he started to cry. So I'd heard about Steiner. Uh, Otto's um, children had told me he was worshipped Otto and was very upset with them when Otto was dying, was in a coma, and they had agreed that they would not prolong his life unduly. Shiner was very angry at them for not keeping him alive longer. So Zimbardo wrote to me and said, Steiner had been interviewing Nazis for years. He would fly to places in Argentina where they were. He has a wonderful uh, record of interviews with these uh, Gestapo people, real serious Nazis, and he didn't. He wanted to give it to somebody. He's now old, and Zimbardo and Rose had said, that I might be someone to have it. And I said, I can't do this. It's really, it takes an awful lot out of you to do with this kind of work, to keep your own humanity and not just go in. You can't be judgmental. You can't be um, accepting. You can't get into, you know, oh, this is really interesting, you know, kind of get all into the gory details. So it's a very fine, I always had a uh, difficult time walking there. So um, I suggested that uh, Steiner set up a foundation and make these interviews available. I hope that that's what he's done. I don't know. I haven't heard for about four years. And I should check with Phil to find out what they're doing because I do think it is important that people can get into them if it's very difficult to do. Uh, it's very hard emotionally. And I think it's hard to keep your own, your own sense of the proper sense of detachment that you have to have as an interviewer. So that's uh, one thing. Um, let's see, what were some of the other questions uh, that you mentioned? They were so big <laughs> and so important. Is fatalism a <clears throat> relinqu or this, perhaps is fatalism a relinquishing of the moral ground? I don't know, maybe. Uh, it could be. I think that certainly limiting oneself to care to one's family, I think, is something that is a very common response to this kind of thing. Um, I used to do be very involved in politics, very interested in social welfare policy. I found myself yelling obscenities at the TV news a lot. Uh, my husband said, I don't think it's a good thing to do in front of the children. Uh, when Reagan classified ketchup as a vegetable in the school lunch program, I thought, I've got to do theoretical work. I'm not going to, you know, I don't want my kids hearing me say this language. So I just kind of pulled way back, and, and I basically did that. It's like I feel if I can live my life in Cameo and not do anything bad, try to do a little bit of good, maybe that's all I can expect. I think that's a very common response. Um, so I, I don't know about the big problem, the threats to moral decency and harsh conditions. I think that's, that's a big question that people need to work about. So I don't know how much time if we're over or not, but if. Open it up for okay. other questions at this point. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks, Karen. Um, I remember the, the quote at the end about a footnote and your response to it really puzzling. Because it seemed to me that part of what was being said, I mean, I don't, all I have is what you read, was that meaning that the that, that times when, when our lives are confronting life and death or other kind of serious trauma, that's where the meaning is. And going home and deciding whether to have um, oat bran or Cheerios, that's not so meaningful. And you do hear there's a whole other literature on War gives us meaning where, where traumatic experience or, or, or opportunities to throw yourself into huge moral crises, that that is a source of meaning. And so then when you switched and said, well, the person was saying it was a footnote, that life was a footnote to that meaningful event. And then you say, yeah, but it's, it's where the meaning yeah. is and where we want to yeah. live. And yeah. That's confusing to yeah, me. Yeah, I, I kind of brushed over that too quickly. I wanted to kind of wrap up the talk. It's a very, and it's a very kind of complex thought, I think. Um, one of the things you do when you do interviews is you try to understand what people are saying. You try not to lead them places. Uh, I raised this issue once. I was concerned that I was maybe subtly you lead people. And one of my kids who was then a kind of smart aleck teenager kind of came out of his adolescent fog at dinner one night. So I have these people who stared down the Gestapo. And I said, yeah, and he said, you're not that scary mom. You know, so, uh, so, But what is it silence? What are the things they don't comment on? That often is very significant. And so I found the fact that people did not say, they didn't talk about 
choice. They didn't talk about, uh, you know, how great it was, you know, that, well, the right guys won. So I thought that was very significant. There was no justifying of war. And I thought that war is so horrible when you talk with them that people want to go back to the everyday things. They want to go back to holding their children. They want to go back to, uh, you know, having a nice meal with friends. That those are the things. Uh, I remember when I was in college and we I had a classics course and the guy, we read the uh, Iliad or the Odyssey, I forgot which one it was now, where the, the soldiers had died. I mean, the soldiers, they were sailors, and they wanted to be remembered by their oars, by, you know, rowing. This is what they saw the meaning. How is we spend our time in the everyday small things sometimes are where we find the, uh, some, we create some of the meaning in our lives, I think. Um, and it's not that during these searing moments, it's like someone rips open and shows you where the meaning is. I think it's, you kind of create it in the everyday, in the small ways that you... It's not what a lot of the people who come back from war say. They have a terrible time making the transition back. Right. That when they come back, that their lives seem meaningless. They don't have a connection with it they had before. So it, well, I mean, those are the people... Some do and some don't, but I don't think we can generalize. Well, I'm just generalizing with the people I interviewed. Um, the people that we interviewed, the things that seemed to make them happy were the things that uh, were the everyday things, were the family, were their love of their family, were friends, uh, were feeling that they were connected with something bigger than themselves. Zionism, for example, or uh, they had the religion that was also something that was important. So that the people who did come back and did seem to be able to make connections were people that picked up on their lives before in ways that made them feel that they were productive, they were contributing something. They weren't people who, uh, who at least the ones we interviewed, although Laura Hillman did write a book about it, she thought that was very important. So I think people have to find some way to create some kind of meaning out of this very searing experience. Uh, now that doesn't mean, I, mean, I think what you're talking about is that in times of death, in times of war, uh, you sometimes see who you are. And I think that's definitely true. But uh, it, it's a very subtle point I'm trying to make. I may not be making it very well. Yes? Um, I was wondering about the different uh, people that you interviewed, uh, murder survivors, uh, survivors of you know, Nicaraguan War, Civil War, and then uh, of course, the Vietnam War, and then not mention the Holocaust. Now, one thing obviously common to all of them is, of course, that there are people who lived through traumatic wars, but the wars have ended, mm -hmm. and they've come out of their survivors. So there is a sense of closure, not only personal closure, but also a sense of political closure. All the horrible things that happened during the war are not going to happen to me again. So a Holocaust survivor, you know, copes as part as part of that mechanism that what happened, you know, during those horrible years is not going to happen again. Um, but I was wondering how, what, how, what, what kind of mechanism might exist for thinking about humanity and about you know maintaining a sense of values for people who don't have a sense of closure. For example, <coughs> I'm thinking of the continuing sufferings of say Native Americans in the United States, although the type of violence to which they are put is completely different. It's not that they are attacked by. U.S. military, for example, uh, because of treaty disputes in the 19th century in Colorado, but there are other kinds of suffering. But there is a continuous sense of marginalization and disempowerment that prevails, for example, whether it's Native Americans or you think about, for example, the Palestinians in Israel. Uh, where was the closure for that, for that war? And how do people who live under continuously under a sense of attack, cope with a sense of closure, how would they find their humanity? Well, I think some of the people we interviewed actually were in that situation. I think the man from Afghanistan certainly doesn't have that kind of closure. Uh, the woman who escaped from Iran, uh, her husband actually is back there now under another name. So we had to modify a lot of the details of her life because he would be in danger if he went back. She's still very concerned about, about it, um, feels that situation is very uh, fraught with problems. We interviewed people from uh, Lebanon, who I think things are still a little unsettled there. Now, do they have the same kind of sense of marginalization that I think a, Afri uh, a Native American would have? Um, I don't know. I think most of them had to deal with the immigrant experience. 
Most of the people we talked with were not terribly poor. They were probably um, not affluent, but they had made it in some way in, in America. So I don't think that they felt the kind of marginalization that I think the groups you're talking about would have felt. Um, so I, I don't think I can really answer that question. I don't know um, what would be an interesting group to talk about. It would be another research project, I think. Um, we do have a project we're doing with uh, marginalization in academia, and we're trying to, having one of the theme panels at the American Political Science Association this fall in San Francisco, I think, uh, is, is on that and how the very nature of the discipline that we study is affected by the groups that we not just allow in the group, but the groups that we reward by giving the presidencies, the officers, things of the association. And uh, women, African Americans, Latinos, um, I mean, all, there are all kinds of groups that have been uh, excluded and marginalized. And I think one of the groups that has been marginalized that no one talks about, and we're going to discuss it, is this kind of a socioeconomic class thing. You know, we're at MIT. You know, I went to the University of Chicago. I teach at UCI, and these are not places that are marginal. But most of the people who get PhDs in political science actually don't go about third, about 25 percent third don't don't go into academia at all. A lot teach in community colleges. A lot are uh, what they call freeway flyers. Um, they're just not recognized in, in the academy. And so, but what, how does their experience and the fact that you leave them out influence the very nature of the discipline that we take? So we're trying to look at that, but that's it's not exactly the issue that you... So I think that would be a really interesting research project to talk about, talk about how people deal with that kind of thing, the ongoing marginalization, and how they can change and get out of it. Um, I think one of the things that people have done and I think some of the Jewish groups, uh, Jewish individuals we talked with, uh, do still have, are the closest that have to that, because there still is a lot of anti-Semitism, I think, existing in the world. And I think part of Herb Kalman's response is instructive. Laura Hillman's is also instructive. I think they've, they've uh, clung to their Jewish identity and made it a positive thing. And I think you can see this, I don't know much about the Native American movement, but I would guess that, that would be what it is. The whole kind of black is beautiful thing would be sort of the same. Taking what other people view as a negative and saying, no, we should be proud about this. So that's the best I can answer without having studied it. One more question? Yes? Just thank you. The vast majority of the mechanisms that you um, elucidated, not all, but most of them have to do with what individuals uh, have yep. done. You know, Not groups. Yeah. Etc. Uh, at, at the same time, I'm wondering if we have any, um, of course I haven't read the book, but if we have any examples from more recent situations like Guatemala, uh, Rwanda, um, South Africa, uh, where there have been instantiation of uh, more social technologies like Truth and Reconciliation Mm -hmm. you know, which are not universally mm -hmm. applied, but mm -hmm. still. Uh, if, if, if we have some examples from folks who've been through those uh, scenarios, and then they said, you know, I benefited greatly from participating in that process and reclaiming yeah. my humanity, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think there are, uh, I think Violeta Chamorro is an example in, in Nicaragua, how she really, I'm a mother, you know, my husband was killed because of the, the, the war. I have sons who are on different sides of this, you know, but I'm a mother. That was her, that was kind of a mothers can unify to, I think if you look at the Northern Ireland situation, which has been, you know, a horrible situation for about 500 years and seems maybe to be kind of drawing down to, I think two things kind of happened. One is that you did find it was the mother's movement that went out in the streets and said, we're tired of having our children killed. We want to, you know, we've got to get beyond this. But I think what also happened was something that's very classic in social identity theory, which is really interesting theory, that we define ourselves in relationship to other people. And so uh, what did they do? They, last time I was in Northern Ireland, I had a cab driver who was complaining that you know we didn't take a cab far enough. We were going to walk back or something, and and um, um, he said it's all these these um, African cab drivers are coming or taking the things away. So it's like there's a new group. So now it's not the Protestants and the uh, Catholics that are fighting. It's like you know we're united. We're Irish. We're against these immigrants, which is depressing to me. Uh, and I find a lot of social identity theory very depressing. But I think that's often what happens is that people form broader groups and there's another enemy that's outside. And I look at the immigration movement in this country, I wonder what's gonna be happening with that as it goes on. So 
I'm sorry, I really didn't answer your question. Maybe we can talk later about it. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you.